my task today, I guess, is to present to you some information on nutrition and the recovery journey. And when I first thought about how I was going to put this together, my mind was scrambled. I thought I can take this in probably four or five different directions and I eventually narrowed it down to something which hopefully will be um, informative at some level for you guys. So one of the things we know about nutrition recovery, and Anthea spoke very well to this, is that it's often widely regarded that it's an integral aspect of eating disorder care. Um, it's, it's, it's in the published guidelines from the Royal Australian College of Psychiatry, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK. And from that perspective, the role of nutrition in recovery has a definite space. This is further highlighted in the recent initiative from the MBS and Medicare in terms of the funding for 20 dietitian sessions for outpatient treatment for eating disorders. And one of the challenges in this space, I think, is when we look at evidence-based care, and especially in terms of the manualised model, manualised models don't necessarily make reference or call for dietetic input or referral out. And so one of the challenges that I, I've certainly found as an outpatient clinician is having GPs and psychologists referring out for people to access that with some understanding that if they're referring to a dietitian in this space, it's not evidence-based treatment. And so I think Anthea really spoke nicely to that in her presentation. The third point I'd like to make is we know that when we look across all eating disorder diagnoses, irrespective of what one we're looking at, is dietary restriction has a fairly active component in all elements. So whether it be anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, ARFID or the others, is dietary restriction is certainly central and plays a key role in that presentation. And this slide just highlights the, um, the, the role of dieting and dietary restriction in the context of eating disorders from that transdiagnostic approach. So we have a look at uh, nutrition and what nutrition means in terms of uh, presentations, etc. One of the ways I think about this is that dietary restriction often leads to clinical and also subclinical malnutrition. And where I think that has its space is that from a dietitian's point of view, this is a clinical diagnosis that we'll often make. And in the context of eating disorder treatments, as I see them in some cases, is this presence of clinical malnutrition often gets treated in a subclinical way. So parents are often tasked with, in FBT, treating clinical malnutrition and refeeding the child. In CBT and other evidence-based treatments, the clinically significant malnutrition is often treated by uh, a process that I would sometimes refer to as being not clinical. And the purpose of that is, is when we start looking at clinical malnutrition, the treatment of that, what we start looking at is we look at energy availability, we look at the dis distribution of protein and nutrients across the day, uh, we have a look at micronutrient composition, etc., etc. So from a nutritional point of view, we dig fairly deep in terms of the processes that we can utilise to address that malnutrition that's present in the vast majority of our clients. And further to that, I would, I would also say that just as we often talk about in this space that eating disorders don't discriminate on weight, I would also add that malnutrition falls into the same category, that people in larger bodies can experience malnutrition equally as somebody in a smaller body. So if we start having a look at the, the role of dietitians in, in treatment, um, et cetera, in the inpatient space, I, I, it's hard for me to recall uh, eating disorder treatment facility where there's not a dietitian involved. So dietitians are very much embedded into inpatient treatment. And I think they're also very much embedded into, into day program treatment. But when we start looking at the outpatient setting, and as Anthea touched on where most of eating disorder treatment takes place, the role of dietitians is often questionable. Um, again, if we look at evidence-based uh, manualised models and fidelity to that model, there's not a lot of uh, uh, call for dietetic input. Having said that, there's a number of leading clinicians and leading private practice multidisciplinary teams around Australia who have dietitians embedded as part of their practice. So it sort of gets me thinking, when we're talking about evidence-based practice, are we talking about evidence-based models as per the manual, 
or are we talking about fidelity to that model and adjunct treatments in terms of that broader multidisciplinary care? And so I think this outpatient space is one of the areas I want to sort of touch on a little bit in the presentation around the values that dietitians and treating nutrition more of a clinical way can potentially add value. So when I start thinking about the nutritional goals of treatment, one of the things I think about is there's nutritional rehabilitation, and Anthea spoke to that nicely. And the other thing is trying to help people develop this more sustainable, positive relationship with food. Because nutritional rehabilitation, I think, can really be achieved through nutritional adequacy, regular eating, and correcting some of those elements of starvation syndrome, etc. However, having a more positive relationship with food that helps in terms of the sustainability of recovery involves a whole process of food management, which might include shopping, planning, eating socially, and other elements of care as well. And what I would like people to, to give some thought to is, especially in the, in the case of anorexia nervosa, but in, in other um, eating disorders as well, we often have a focus on weight restoration, weight targets. And for me, I'd, I'd sort of like to see that language start to shift in terms of a focus on nutritional rehabilitation. And the reason for that is the way I think about it is weight restoration is secondary to nutritional rehabilitation. But as we start to re-nourish the body, the body uses that nutrition to repair different body systems. It uses that nutrition to rebuild cellular tissue, bone tissue, fat tissue. And it's those processes that result in secondary weight gain. So weight gain is actually a secondary process to the nutritional intervention. And sometimes I think that when we focus on weight restoration, it's, some, it's, it's sort of like getting a red flag out to a bull. It um, really brings out the rage. And I think that there is some benefit in doing that from a systematic um, desensitisation exposure perspective. But the language we use and how we frame this stuff, I think, is something we need to be considerate of. So when we start looking at nutritional management and what that might look like, it takes a number of um, uh, various stages, I guess, in, in terms of the role of a dietitian. So there's, it's widely accepted, again, that dietitians shouldn't be operating in this space solely and independently and definitely need to be integrating as part of a multidisciplinary team that involves medical support in addition to mental health support and psychological therapy. When we're working with clients, uh, if we're facilitating this work, we would generally do a nutritional assessment that would then be formulated into a nutritional diagnosis. And as dietitians, without mental health training, we don't have the ability to diagnose eating disorders, but we certainly have the ability to diagnose nutritionally related conditions secondary to that. So an example of that might be protein energy malnutrition, it might be iron deficiency and other elements of nutritional care. That diagnosis then informs our dietetic intervention, and I'll speak to that a little bit later. We then monitor and evaluate, and then we go through the cycle again. And the Dietitians Association of Australia um, have, a, have a resource um, that was updated recently that outlines the care and best practice for nutritional management of anorexia nervosa. But there is a lot of um, content in that document that's also relevant to the other eating disorders as well. So I won't spend too much time exploring this slide, but essentially takes you through the the key elements, I guess, that are usually fairly integral in terms of a dietitian assessment that allows us to be in a position to inform the intervention to address the nutritional mal uh, malnutrition or rehabilitation process. So first of all, we might take a food and nutrition history, get an understanding of the person's uh, belief systems, eating patterns, foods they avoid, etc. We look at anthropometry, height, weight, uh, body image relationships. We might explore biochemistry, and, and this is where we really value the, the role of GPs. Um, as dietitians, we're, we're well trained in biochemistry, physiology, and the interrelationship between those things and food. And so having that information at hand will often direct the, the direction of our intervention and the targets of what we want to be managing from a nutritional perspective. From a clinical and me medical history, uh, we explore co-occurring illnesses, we look at bone mineral density, bone health, menstrual function, etc. Things that are often uh, involved in terms of compromise in the eating disorders. We obviously explore diet history, etc. Uh, eating behaviours, associated symptoms and beliefs. 
and then also feeding risks associated with that. So once we've done the assessment, we then move into the nutritional diagnosis. And one of the things we look at here is trying to identify if the eating disorder or if the presentation itself relating to nutrition is associated with some sort of eating disorder or disordered eating process that may be consistent or look like elements of anorexia nervosa, bulimia, binge eating disorder, etc., or whether there are other factors that uh, might be contributing to, to the person's relationship with food. And when we start looking at dietitian medical nutrition therapy, there's a whole range um, of conditions that can be influential there. We try and identify and diagnose the nutritional presentation, which is that element I spoke about earlier, and we try and identify further whether or not it's uh, uh, the person's relationship with food is specifically targeted with uh, eating disorder weight concerns or whether there are other factors there which might be sensory related. And we tend to see that a little bit more in ARFID around texture, taste, foods touching, those types of things. And certainly in the, in, in the clinical space, there are a number of uh, published tools that can be used to screen for malnutrition and they are uh, widely used in the inpatient setting, probably not as widely used in an outpatient setting. But I think where this is a space where dietitians can really play a role in, in screening for disordered eating and, and malnutrition in terms of trying to identify uh, the presence of malnutrition and then secondary trying to explore the, the factors that are contributing to that. So the nutritional intervention process is, is usually informed by the diagnosis and involves a, a number of elements that we would give consideration to. So if we're working in the eating disorder space, the intervention might uh, be influenced by the type of treatment modality they're involved in. So if somebody's doing FBT, that might look different if they're doing CBT or SSCM. We take into account any co-occurring presentations that might have a clinical element, such as gluten intolerance or uh, gut problems, etc. And then also lifestyle, so physical activity, which has a an, uh, an impact when we start looking at the energy demands and the nutritional demands on the body and making sure that they're being fueled for adequately. When it comes to nutrition intervention, uh, as a dietitian, we don't have a lot to hang our hat here on in terms of the, the evidence, um, but there's a couple of frameworks that are often used and, and uh, I guess used by dietitians, but also used in the context of the evidence-based treatments in their delivery as well. So there's the rule of threes um, that Marsha Heron from the US has uh, published in a book that she has on nutrition counselling and eating disorders. And the principle there is, is that you have three meals, three snacks, no more than three hours apart, so it provides some structure to that process. There's the real food pyramid that Susan Hart, one of our colleagues in Sydney, developed recently and published in 2018. And then there's the Raves Eating Model, which I developed back in 2005, which provides a, a framework for developing a positive relationship with food and would be a workshop uh, later on after morning tea that covers that in a bit more detail. So when we have a look at those, those resources and tools that we use, one of the things that often comes up around what we do as dietitians is every now and then we get a referral that comes through where it come from the GP or it might come from the psychologist and the request will be for a meal plan. And from, from my perspective, meal plans don't form a, a big part of my clinical practice. Um, I think if, I, if it was as simple as handing out a meal plan, I'd probably just stand on the street and hand them out and, and people would get better, that would be great. Um, but my experience is that meal plans are, uh, are very limited in their application unless they're done in collaboration with the, with the person and the, the options that are provided on that meal plan are largely driven by the client themselves. And then our role as a dietitian then is to try and, I guess, tidy that up a little bit and work towards the, it addressing the nutritional aspects that uh, we're trying to target. The other, the other element I think that is really important and sometimes gets overlooked in terms of the nutritional care process is trying to understand the, the, the sequence that's involved in uh, the nutritional process prior to consumption. So I know when I'm working on an inpatient unit, we put a lot of effort into supportive meal therapy and trying to bring that together so the person consumes adequate nutrition. And I think that in some ways we ill-prepare people from the transition from inpatient to outpatient treatment because a lot of this stuff doesn't get addressed during the inpatient um, admission. 
So the way I think about the food management process is at some point in the day, we need to make a decision around what we're going to eat. So do we make a decision about breakfast when we wake up? Do we make a decision around lunch early in the morning? You know, I'm often caught leaving the mince in the freezer and then not getting it out for the spaghetti bolognese at night time, which can be a bit of a problem. But at some point, we've got to make a decision around what we're eating. And in CBT and guided self-help, there's a process where people do some advanced planning for that. But if people don't plan, my experience is they often get overwhelmed around the choice. When they get overwhelmed, they go back to safety. When they go back to safety, they go back to their eating disorder behaviour. So giving people a plan of some sort to guide their process at the start can be beneficial. Once that plan's in place, we've got to buy the food. That often involves, involves going to the shop. And in my experience, a lot of the clients we work with don't have a good relationship with the supermarket. There's often a lot of anxiety, a lot of label reading, and a lot of confusion. And, and I think this extends to the broader community as well. You know, confusion around what does a healthy star rating mean? Is this food better than that food? How do I choose the best food? And so in, from a nutritional perspective, as we work on this idea of nutrition recovery, it's trying to help equip people with the skills and the understanding of how to navigate, you know, the minefield that is the, that is the supermarket. Once they're in the supermarket, they've got to make food choices, which I've sort of spoken to. Those food choices then get pulled down into the particular meal, so whether that meal be breakfast, lunch or dinner. So I've decided that for dinner we're going to have spaghetti bolognese. The next step is how we're going to prepare that. And, 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 and this is where I think some of the elements of nutrition become important in terms of trying to get adequate nutrition in place without leading to high levels of volume in the diet, which can be overwhelming modifying the fibre in the diet to help manage uh, the uh, gastroparesis and delayed peristalsis and some of those gut functions. So when we're working with clients in terms of this space, we're looking beyond just the focus of enough energy to support weight restoration. We're looking at fibre management, micronutrients, distribution across the day, and these things have a potential impact on how the body uh, restores that uh, body tissue in terms of optimising lean tissue, body fat, etc. So we've identified how we're preparing the food, the next step comes portioning the food, and then obviously consumption and then containment of compensatory behaviours. So you can see there's a whole chain of things that are involved in that nutrition process and I think when we focus on uh, meal planning, we're really focusing on the consumption part and not really equipping people with these other skills. So now that we've got that all out of the way, we start looking at the nutritional intervention. Uh, as I mentioned, we, the one model that can be used is the RAVES model. It's fairly simple, basic. I sort of think of it as a back pocket tool. And it has application, from my perspective, across all eating disorder diagnoses. But it also has application across chronic disease um, and just helping people have a good relationship with food. So first of all, we want people to be eating regularly. You know, it's very difficult if you've got somebody trying to get 3,000 calories in a day to restore their nutrition to get that in if they're not eating regularly. So that provides a platform. And there's also benefits in regular eating in terms of reducing binge eating, stabilising blood sugars, etc. Regularity provides a platform then for uh, adequacy and enough nutrition to be consumed in the diet. And when we look at adequacy, we tend to look at it from two different perspectives. So one perspective being... Uh, the, the quantity of nutrition and the energy needs being met and the other element being the, the quality of nutrition and the, the balance of nutrition uh, in terms of macronutrients and micronutrients as well. What's interesting is regularity and adequacy really only address the nutrition rehabilitation process and don't necessarily have a, a marked impact uh, on quality of life. And so if I think about inpatient treatment, inpatient treatment we do regularity and accuracy very well. The rest of it around variety and social eating we probably don't do so well and spontaneity. Variety becomes important because it allows us to challenge dietary rules, belief systems, unpack those systems that the eating disorder uses to maintain uh, a rigid approach to food and a rigid approach to eating. So we're starting to build a bit of flexibility in here. Variety then provides a platform for social eating, engaging with family, engaging with friends in social situations, 
And then at the end, we've got spontaneity, which is really an ability to adapt to the environment the person's in. So whether they're going to the movies, whether they're having a, a function, whether it's Easter, the ability to, to feel comfortable in those situations. And then once we've run through that process, the, I guess the, the ideal um, goal is to try and help people engage and link back in with where we all started is in this process of intuitive eating. And, you know, when we're talking about this, I often talk about, you know, when we're born, if you think about a baby, a baby just, you know, feeds intuitively. You know, there's no thought process, no cognitive process associated with it. And as we move through life, we start to become a little bit more disconnected from that intuitive process and start to overlay that with a cognitive structure. And that cognitive structure can become inhibitive in terms of having that good, natural, intuitive relationship with food. And then there's the, uh, the real food pyramid. So what this does, I think, it really adds value to the adequacy and variety elements of, of the RAVES model and provides a framework and a, a different way for people to, to understand nutrition in the treatment of eating disorders. And so one of the things that often comes up when we're managing people from an eating point of view is how come I need to do things differently to my sister or my peers at school, etc. And the reason is because we're focusing on nutrition rehabilitation in the context of an eating disorder. And so in the general population, there's a, a plate model that's often used to guide different portions and different uh, amounts of different food groups, whereas what this uh, pyramid, I guess, applies for is more the eating disorder-specific population. So you will notice some differences here relative to the, the broader population uh, recommendations. While we're managing all of the, the, the food-based stuff, we wrap that up in a lot of nutrition education and nutrition counselling. And, you know, what, one of the resources that we use a lot here at the Centre for Clinical Intervention Resources, they've got it's a really good package, and a, a lot of those have a, a strong nutritional focus. We'll often use, use those resources as a way of introducing a topic and then expanding on a little bit further from that more dietetic perspective. As part of care, we, we review and monitor process, so we would have a look at the person's ability to implement those dietary changes. We would then sit that alongside the, the biochemistry, the physical obs, weight changes, um, other measures of progress, and then modify the plan accordingly. So that's an ongoing process that happens throughout the treatment model. And then other considerations to consider when dietitians become involved, I guess, from a dietetic perspective, and one of the lived experience um, speakers yesterday spoke about being weighed three times on the same day. Well, that's what we want to try and avoid. And so some of the questions that come up for me are, do we, as, as a dietitian, should I be weighing the patient or not? And I guess that comes back to the treatment modality the person may already be gauged in. Do we set goal weights or not? And I think for, in, some, in some cases, setting goal weights can be beneficial. And then on the other hands, it can create a rod for our own back. Um, in, in terms of that rigid thinking, if people struggle to let go of that as a, as a uh, rigid uh, goal. Do we meal plan or do we not meal plan? So do we give people a lot of structure to the eating process or do we give them, <coughs> excuse me, do we give them general guidelines? And then some of these other processes around food journaling, et cetera, et cetera. And as I've touched on, whatever we're doing as dietitians in that role of nutrition rehabilitation should always be done in the context of a multidisciplinary team. So to <coughs> borrow the words of Carolyn Coston, when we have a look at this space, it is about the food because without the food we can't achieve the nutrition rehabilitation, but it's not about the food because there's stuff that sits behind the context in which the person's engagement with eating exists. And so one way I think about this is you've got, the, you've got the medical stuff that sort of wraps everything around, and you've got the nutritional uh, side of management and the psychological management, and they've sort of got to move in some sort of tandem. And what tends to happen if they don't move in tandem, I think there's this rubber band attaching the two. And if the nutrition goes too far ahead without the psychological support, it's likely to collapse. And if the psychological work's done without the nutritional support, it's likely to collapse as well. And where we tend to see this from my perspective is probably more in an inpatient setting where there's a significant focus on nutrition rehabilitation but not so much a focus on the psychological therapy. 
And when you talk to people with a lived experience, they'll often say, well, I don't feel I've been equipped to deal with the weight change or the changing eating or the experience I've had. So that psychological element's largely missing. So trying to be mindful of moving those two things together about it being about the food and, and not about the food. So I just want to finish briefly with, um, with this slide, which comes from the sporting field. So this is taken from the International Olympic Committee consensus from a publication in 2018, which has a look at energy deficiency in sport. And so in, in that space, what we tend to see is, is athletes who are training at a certain level, don't get enough nutrition, they start to experience a range of, uh, a range of things that impact negatively on their health and negatively on their performance. And when I have a look through this, um, this diagram, to me it mimics a lot of the stuff we talk about with the starvation syndrome and the Minnesota study, etc. So from a health perspective, you can see a number of body organ systems affected there. There's really nothing that's untouched. And from a health perspective, there's reference there to poor concentration, mood, irritability, etc. And so to me, <clears throat> To me, the significance of this slide is really highlighting the fact that it's not so much weight and weight loss that we need to be concerned about, it's more the presence of energy deficiency. And we know that with dieting being so common in today's society, and the way the body adapts to that dieting process, is you can be energy deficient in your intake at any weight. And so again, we want to be mindful that we're not discriminating on that principle in the context of our interpretation of these presentations. <clears throat> so in summary, nutrition rehabilitation is a core element and, and uh, Anthea consolidated that in terms of the treatment of eating disorders. And from my perspective, and I may be a little bit biased, but I think, <clears throat> but I think the dietitians are de definitely well positioned to contribute to that nutritional rehabilitation process from a, from a um, food management point of view, but also from a practical point of view that expands the, the breadth of the food management process. Thank you.